Hi, my name is Agnes. I am part of the Living History Company IG Fitness Jahrhundert, and today we are talking about menstrual hygiene in medieval times. As a hobby living historian that is also into historical accuracy a lot, I do a lot of things for my hobby that may seem a bit uh, whack. And one of those things I will talk about today. I tried using medieval menstrual hygiene products. So I was inspired by Abby Cox's video a while ago in which she recreated an 18th century period apron and I had always wanted to try out um, menstrual hygiene products for my period of impression, pun not intended. But I always chickened out and frankly with an office job that wasn't really something I could easily do over more than a day. But since we are in lockdown for a bit longer, now is the time to do it. I will have four sections in this video. The first one is talking about menstruation in medieval times in general. The second is talking about evidence for menstrual hygiene products. One is talking about my reconstructions and one is talking about the experiment itself. And I shall put the timestamps into the description for you to jump to the part that interests you the most. A short disclaimer, I will mostly be talking about menstrual hygiene in a Christian-dominated society in Middle Europe in high and late medieval times, and medieval being a term to describe an episode of European history, because with our focus being everyday life of the mid-14th century in Austrian Germany, I'm not really qualified to give you a lot of information on early medieval menstrual hygiene or menstrual hygiene in other periods of human history or in other cultures. So really what I wanted to do in this video is to take you with me during a practical experiment, but I will have to give you a little tiny insight into the medieval understanding of menstruation um, in order for you to fully understand the choices that I made in this experiment. In the 14th century, the overall understanding of medicine was heavily influenced by humoral theory. That was a medical tradition taken over from ancient Greek and Roman medicine when scholars such as Hippocrates and Galen formed or rather wrote down the main ideas of humoral pathology that were still prevalent in medieval times. Some roots of this theory go much further back in time to, for example, ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. There is a lot to say and read about humoral theory out there on that, so I will not wrap that up here, but to give you a very basic understanding, Physicians back then believed that the human body was influenced by four humors or vital bodily fluids blood, yellow bile, black bile and phlegm. Um, the humors needed to be in a delicate balance in order for the body and mind to be healthy. Once one was present too much or too little, um, the balance would be lost and people would get sick or at least they would change physically or mentally. People believed that you could influence this balance by following certain diets and certain behavioral routines and that also included physical activity, personal hygiene, etc. and of course medical applications. And they believed that um, you could help the body to shed the toxic fluid amounts um, by just draining them, for example by bloodletting and bloody cupping and leaching and also that the body would shed the humors naturally. For example, male bodies were thought to grow hair on all kinds of body parts, mostly the face, and that um, would bring these imbalances out of the body, and that female bodies menstruated for that purpose. So menstruation was seen as a sort of uh, cleaning process of the female body in order for it to remain healthy, and it's actually something that is still believed today, although that does not really correspond to what we know about medicine. The organs that clean your body of toxins are your kidneys and your liver, not your womb. They also thought that menstrual blood was unclean because basically it was supposed to be full of toxins and that retaining it in the body was not healthy and uh, oversimplified that the region down there needed to be aired well at all times and not to be clogged up by fabric. And that was another reason for women not to wear pants or underpants in everyday situations. When people start talking about menstrual hygiene in the Middle Ages um, in online forums, often you will find that the discussion at some point starts evolving around the question whether or not menstruation was actually a daily thing that people had to deal with back then. The Menache, or the first menstruation, was believed to set in between the age of 9 and 16, and menopause was expected to arrive between 45 and 50, so that means that we have around 30 years of cycles to cover for. Now usually women were married when they reached um, adulthood, so at around 17 to 20 years old, and the average high to late medieval family had between two to four living children, meaning 
that including a high infant death rate, which meant up to double that amount worth of pregnancies and nursing periods, most women would have several years of their adult lives in which they did not, in fact, menstruate. Also, physical activity, physical constitution and malnutrition would have an influence on the number of periods and the amount of menstrual discharge. But not all people back then had to do hard physical work and malnourishment was certainly the exception rather than the rule of medieval daily life. So that leaves at least several years of monthly periods to be dealt with. As we heard in our introduction about medicine, Clearly, they did not know a lot about why menstruation happened back then, but they did know, through observation, that menstruation was a normal thing and that its absence was not normal and that something was probably going off on if the menses was absent. So even medieval people thought that some amount of bleeding was normal and uh, daily occurrence. In medieval books about medicine, we often find recipes and guidelines on what to do if the menses is absent or too strong or too light, or if you have menstrual cramps and all the fun little problems that menstruation might bring with it. So we can safely say that people had to deal with all kinds of different um, menses um, throughout the society. If you would like to know more about women's medicine in medieval times, I highly recommend these two books that I will also uh, link in the description below. And one is a translation of the Trotula, a gynecological compendium from the 12th century that was allegedly written by a female physician, Trota of Salerno, who studied and taught at the famous medical university of Salerno in Italy. And honestly, the discussion around female physicians of the Middle Ages is a whole other topic that you should absolutely read up upon if you have the time. And uh, the other one is a translation of the Secretis Mulierum, or Women's Secrets, by Albertus Magnus, another well-known gynecological text from the Middle Ages. So while we know with high certainty that women back then did not wear panties on a regular basis, as they also did not until the 19th century, they must have dealt with all of that somehow. Free bleeding and wiping would of course work if you have a light flow and don't have to do a lot of physical work all day. And we know from sources and personal records that until the early 20th century, free bleeding was definitely a thing for some. Bathing, which they absolutely did a lot, can also help keep everything easier, even with menstrual hygiene products, but they must have had some kind of contraption to catch discharge before ruining their dresses. Plus, there was also other circumstances to cover for, like, for example, lochial flow, mm -hmm. that means bleeding and vaginal discharge for several weeks after giving birth, and incontinence, that is also a very common problem after pregnancy. So, what evidence on hygiene products do we actually have? We know from the mentioned uh, medical works that they did already know a sort of vaginal suppository that was used for certain medical applications. But while many take this as a hint um, to the use of tampons, there is actually no evidence that suggests that the concept of a tampon to fetch menstrual blood was already invented at the time. And honestly, under the hygienic conditions of the time, that may have been a bad idea because there's only so much time that it is going to take until you catch an infection down there. One thing that we can actually know from textual sources is that they used something they called uh, menstrual rags or menstrual cloth and we have several sources for that. One record is from an inquisitional trial in 14th century Montaigu, that is in France, uh, where a woman named Beatrice de Panisol was um, caught with a blood-stained piece of cloth in her possession um, that was actually an menstrual rags of her daughters that she wanted to put into the drink of her son-in-law as a sort of magical practice to make him always stay faithful to her daughter. And then we have a record of Saint Birgitta of Sweden in the 14th century that mentions menstrual cloth in her revelations when she says you will be thrust away like an abortion or a menstrual cloth and thereby she's citing a sentence from the Bible in the book of Isaiah um, so that could actually be a part of be, um, beliefs from antiquity, but one might argue that Birgitta had at least an understanding of what she was talking about, otherwise she wouldn't have mentioned it. Then we have the physician Bernard de Gordon from the 13th century, writing about menstrual cloth twice in his works. Um, one time he suggests to use them as a way to ward off unwanted suitors, and I have a feeling that he might be referencing the story of Hippatia from late antiquity here. And then he also tells women to bring their menstrual rags to a physician 
so that he can inspect the color of the blood in order for him to come up to a, a diagnosis for them. Robin Netherton, um, and she's a costume historian and the editor of the amazing costume history and textile archaeology book series, Medieval Clothing and Textiles. Uh, a while ago she wrote in a forum discussion about the find of a grave of an old lady in the huge archaeological um, excavation complex of Hayelfsnes in Greenland in the 1920s. Um, when the anthropologists back then examined the bones, they found a sort of leather strap of seal skin between her legs that was held up at Mount Pubis and in the sacral region with wooden cords. And unfortunately, to what those were attached was undeterminable. Um, but inside the leather strap, there seems to have been some sort of fiber, wool or plant fiber, definitely. And they also found traces of moss, although it wasn't clear whether this could have been a contamination from the dig. Um, and even some of her pubic hair was preserved. Um, the anthropologists thought that this could have possibly belonged to some sort of an incontinence pet. And then we have one recent find in Oslo that is woolen fabric from a latrine um, that the archaeologists um, suspect to be menstrual rags on their blog. But unfortunately nothing concrete has been published so far as I know and I can't tell you whether this might be just um, toilet paper rags which are also commonly found in latrines. And then finally, we have this picture from 15th century Swiss Aurora Convergence manuscript um, that is possibly showing a woman with hitched up skirts menstruating in the middle of a wheel, symbolizing the 12th zodiac signs of the year and therefore possibly the 12 cycles of menstruation of the year. And in her hand, she holds something red and folded that may actually be menstrual wax. A very exciting illumination, um, although the surrounding text of the manuscript does not give a detailed description of what the picture is supposed to show. Um, only a vague context about the creation of the fetus in the womb and about um, female um, fertility. I will link and describe these sources again in the blog article belonging to this video that I will link in the description box so you can take a closer look at everything if you want to. Okay, so the evidence is scarce, but not as scarce as one might think, and I think these sources already gave us a good hint that textiles were definitely playing a role here, and the main question that I have is how to hold up such a menstrual cloth or a rag so it stays in place during the day. So let's talk about how I made this into my own experiment in the next part. Okay, so it is the day before the experiment, or at least that is what my body is telling me. And I just wanted to show you all the equipment that I have before I use it. I brought my little bag here that I made for the um, menstrual hygiene products. And in there is um, obviously menstrual rags. I cut these from um, old um, undergarments that I had and that I don't use anymore, um, and from um, just fabric um, that I uh, did not use anymore, just the, the last rags that I had from um, several linen fabrics. Um, I cut, cut up into different size pieces. I thought that cutting these from old garments is probably also what people did back then, because we know they used um, rags from old garments as toilet paper as well, um, and that's actually a very good idea, because these are gonna get um, stained very heavily and if you cannot rewash them um, maybe you rewash them and they are still um, taking taking some, some color or you don't want to reuse them anymore you just cut them up even smaller and then use it as toilet paper and then just throw it into the latrine and be done with it so that's last stages of, of fabric um, that it would would have been given something like that um, where you throw it away afterwards um, and then I have these two here and these are pads that I made myself. Um, I was inspired by the Robin Netherton find because she talked about fiber and uh, moss uh, being in that incontinence um, contraption that that old lady had. And um, I just made little linen bags and filled them with sphagnum moss. Um, sphagnum moss is um, a kind of moss that is growing all around Europe, mostly in Northern Europe, obviously. Um, because they have the right uh, climate for that, um, but also here in Austria. Um, it is a moss that can take a lot of um, liquid in it. So um, the amount of moss that is in here um, will soak up up to a liter of um, liquid water or whatever you give it until it is saturated. Um, obviously I will not use it that long, but um, 
that should give me a lot of security until anything soaks through. So I'm having very high hopes um, for these pads. And um, the fun thing about this is that when I researched sphagnum moss as a use for menstrual products, obviously there's no there's no evidence um, for the use of that moss. But it is but it will work like a sponge, um, and sponges are very expensive in that time, obviously. So you would um, have something like this freely available. Um, you can just collect it yourself, dry it, and then use it, um, and throw the um, used moss away if you don't want it anymore. There was actually a 19th century company that made those. Um, they they called it just moss pads and they made menstruation pads from, from moss and linen and they had little um, girdles that you can attach it to um, and they still used it in that time. And the fun thing that I also found out about sphagnum moss is that it was also called uh, blood moss in history. That is mostly for um, its use in um, dressing battle wounds um, because it is uh, an antiseptic uh, plant and it um, can take a lot of, uh, can take up a lot of liquid so that would be perfect for dressing wounds and um, putting on my little aluminium foil hat here um, I mean that is a very suspicious name isn't it <laughs> I will get through probably half a day to a day with one of those pads um, and I will see how, how long they work um, and to hold them up I have it's just a very simple belt made from hemp woven hemp um, and it has two holes on one side and um, two strings that I just braided out of those um, warp threads um, myself and if you want to put it on you just um, put the strings through the holes, make a half notch, and like that it, you can easily um, pull it off. The idea um, I actually got from, from breech belts, because the man in our uh, company, um, the IG Fetzen, they, they use um, breech belts just like this, um, woven either from hemp or linen, um, after a find that has been made um, from the 13th century, from the tomb of Philip of Schwaben. And he had a breech belt that was actually woven from silk. Um, it was very um, expensive, of course. It was um, brocaded and everything looked very expensive, but it had just the same fastening method. And I thought if they had something um, to hold up menstrual rags, that would probably be something that they already knew from their daily lives. And um, a men's, men's breech belt would be just the thing that, that I would um, invent then. And to hold everything up, I have one of two possibilities. One is this, that's just a long piece of linen fabric and one side has a little tunnel here um, and then it goes, well the belt goes through that and then it goes obviously between my legs and on the other side it's just a loose end that I tuck into the belt, um, adjust it um, and I can actually adjust it throughout the day if I want to then put a little pin in it. Um, and be done with it. So that should hold up uh, pretty nicely and will give me some extra security because it also can soak up um, some liquid if needed. And the other thing that I have is this um, and I was inspired by the find of Robin Netherton again. Um, this is um, just two layers of, of linen fabric um, and I wanted to recreate that strip of leather that uh, they found on that woman. Um, and I made it from linen because you can actually rewash that and I don't need the additional security for leaking through that the woman would have had with her seal skin. Um, this um, will probably do and it has uh, four ribbons at the ends so you can attach it um, to the left and the right um, on the belt. Um, um, so that will be some kind of a makeshift panty and obviously you just put the pads and the rags inside. If I want to wash it, I can just take off, take off the ribbons and um, rewash the fabric and then put them on again. So that would be much more practical than the leather solution because you can't really wash the leather that well. And then I have some uh, leftover uh, moss that I just keep in this little bag here and um, I will take it 
mostly on events because I won't remake any any uh, menstrual hygiene products um, in this experiment. I can make some pads very quickly if I need to, um, or I can refill my pads um, with with a clean moss. And I can also show um, visitors what is in the pads if they want to know. Uh, and obviously I'm going to show them uh, clean and new pads, not my used ones. Um, and you can see here, it's just this, this dried moss. It's very um, fluffy in there and it smells a bit earthy. Um, that is so far everything that I have. Um, I will start tomorrow and see how well it goes. Um, and if I can actually stick through at least three or four days um, of using different methods and the different um, ideas that I had um, and then take you along with the camera and um, tell you a bit uh, about how my day is, uh, is going and uh, how well it, it keeps up to um, the use and to walking and working and what I do in it. Um, yeah, and uh, I shall see you tomorrow. So it is day one of my experiment um, and I am already hating myself for doing this. Um, I have some light flow so I put on um, some of my menstrual rags and uh, the belt of course and the holder and I'm feeling quite shit because honestly although I feel that like nothing's gonna leak and uh, everything's gonna be fine I still hate the feeling of of wearing pads or or anything other than tampons and uh, menstrual cups that I have been wearing for the last 20 years and I'm just totally not used to this and I hate how it feels so that's gonna be the biggest challenge for today I thought I would take my dog for a walk today because I wanted to mimic some um, action, like work or going out doing chores um, and not just sit all around all day, which is probably what I'm going to be doing tomorrow because tomorrow is going to be my heaviest day and with it comes a lot of cramps. Do some light chores, do some textile crafts and uh, try out the pets for the first time and tonight I'm gonna go to sleep with my menstrual rags and see how they take me through the night probably gonna put something under me just in case anything happens but I'm confident it will not so gonna update you tomorrow morning okay so it is the end of day two of my experiment and um, I have actually stopped the experiment today because I have gone through all my stash within two days only. I clearly underestimated how much of the equipment I would need. Um, I have gone through the menstrual rags within about 24 hours of the experiment. And um, while I did probably exchange it more than um, I would if I was a historical person, I had a very strong bleeding so I, I exchanged them a lot and um, today in the morning I um, um, was through all of them um, the night was very unpleasant I, I will am admit that um, I was very insecure I, I did not feel um, safe at all um, but would I have felt more confident with modern pets probably not because this was really something that was not um, the problem with the historical solution it was the problem with me being used only to um, tampons and, um, and and cups exchanged the um, the rags to the pads and I was much happier with the pad um, it felt so much nicer it was really it was feeling dry and very secure and um, I, I, I did all like the experience much more like I had the feeling that I could go hours and hours with, with those pads. I did exchange them earlier because the fabric just started um, soaking through while the moss wasn't even saturated. But really that that was was a way better experience. Um, although this is probably the, the method that is less um, supported by evidence. 
Um, I also used the um, thinner and shorter strap, a strip that I made of the, the hairiness finds today with the um, attached ribbons. Um, and it was way better than, than yesterday. I actually thought that I would be more comfortable with the um, broad strip of cloth uh, that I wore yesterday. Um, but um, actually the broad cloth, um, it crumpled up between my legs. And if you know linen, it will not go back into shape. It will just stay in that crinkled state. You know, you could always feel that there was something there and it felt quite uncomfortable. So uh, the, the smaller strip was very nice because it, it almost was like wearing a panty and um, that, that worked really well. After um, I changed back to my cup, I was just very happy um, to be through the experiment. I um, was expecting to to enjoy this more, um, but it did work out really well. I, I thought that the, the menstrual rags were an actual alternative. It was actually something that I could imagine people back then doing. Um, it was very easy to exchange, very easy to wear. Um, it, it held up nicely, it did not leak. So if I was to try it again, I would probably uh, try a, a, a holder strip made of, of wool instead of linen, so it doesn't bunch up. Um, although wool isn't as washable, but it didn't really soak through uh, down to the down to the hole, just uh, into the rags, and then it was fine. So what I'm gonna do tomorrow is um, wash the rags and also the bags for the pads. Um, I will just get rid of the moss and then um, pre-soak the um, all the linen uh, rags in hot water and soap for uh, during the night and. Tomorrow I will wash them with um, lye as I would on a historical event and then um, I will probably update you with a little clip on how well that worked but I don't have any concerns that it won't be, won't be clean after the washing. So to sum up my little experiment, menstrual rags can actually work. You can walk and work in them and with the right fastening they will almost work like modern pads. They are washable and reusable and can be made with the simplest available materials. So would I do this again at an event? Probably not, <laughs> because events are already stressful as it is, let alone while battling your period. But who knows, maybe I will have an occasion to make another attempt and um, give some other ideas a go. I hope this video was informative to you. If you have any more questions, please put them in the comment section below. I will read all your comments and answer them as good as I can. Also, please check out the video description with my blog article containing all the information cited here and even more information for you. If you would like to see more of us, do check out our channel and consider to subscribe. We already have plans for future videos. If you would like to follow us on all of our activities, our Facebook site is probably the better um, place to go. It is linked in the description box and um, we are much more active there. Thank you for watching and see you soon.